Hey, Clark, uh, thank you for taking the time. So uh, what what have you been up to in this whole pandemic? Well, I mean, the short answer is not a hell of a lot. Um, you know, the lockdown was kind of sudden and uh, and it's, you know, something I certainly respect and something we've got to do. So I've just been, uh, you know, catching up on some reading and some writing. For a while I was, I need to exercise in the mornings or else I get insane by about two o'clock. Um, just mentally. So I, at first I was, I took up surfing not too long ago. So I was going out and hitting the ocean, which was really effective. They shut that down. Um, I, I practiced Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's another great stress reliever. Can't do that too much close contact. We're doing some zoom classes, not the same. And, uh, so then I started riding a bike and seeing my family, walking the dogs, bike rides, um, watching a little bit of news, but I have to keep it, you know, within the sanity uh, threshold and, uh, you know, working on whatever projects might be next after the final season of uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. airs in May. Well, we're definitely going to get into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. here in just a second. I want to kind of wind back the clock just a little bit, talk about a little bit some of your uh, your earlier work, guys. Um one of your earliest writing projects is really one of my all time favorite psychological thrillers is the movie What Lies Beneath. Phenomenal, phenomenal film. guy. Um, what uh, what can you tell us about your experience uh, writing that film? One of your earlier uh, writing projects working with Harrison Ford, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, um, I, you know, I worked a lot in the theater with the Atlantic Theater Company right out of college, did about 10 years of that in New York and then started to spend some time in L.A. looking to work more in um film and TV and nobody, <laughs> nobody was biting at first. So I, um, I started working, started writing, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to sit around doing nothing. That's not really me. So I started writing some stuff and uh, an amazing executive um, who's done amazing stuff since like the hunger games and a lot of stuff. Nina Jacobson was at DreamWorks and she said, look, I, I like your weird indie that you wrote, but I, I'm interested in this ghost thriller idea that we have. It's like a one sentence idea. And she told me the idea and I was driving across country and by Nebraska, I had a few ideas. And I just got really lucky because the amazing Robert Zemeckis walked in a couple of days after I turned in that draft and said, I'm looking for a psychological thriller. And um, next thing you know, I was meeting with him and he became kind of an amazing mentor and really helped me work on the script for eight or nine months. And then he did this incredible thing where he shot the first half of Castaway with Tom Hanks. Um, and then we shot all of What Lies Beneath. And then he shot the other half of Castaway, um, where he'd lost all this weight and looked different. And um, I can't remember which part was first. And in the, in the, at the beginnings of the Castaway, we talked about how uh, the professor, Norman, should be someone that no one would ever suspect of doing anything wrong. And so, you know, anyone who's not a Harrison Ford fan, I don't fully understand. But so uh, he sent it to Harrison and Harrison was, yeah, let's do this. I love this. And, um, and Michelle came along very soon after. They were both so incredible and kind. And, and so was Zemeckis, who kept me around during the whole production in Vermont. I had written it. I'd done theater with Atlantic in Burlington, Vermont, for many summers. And I'd written it with that town in mind. And they called me. I never told them. And Steve Stark, uh, Robert's production head, said, you know, I think we might shoot it in Burlington, Vermont. So already there was some kind of weird psychic energy going on. And it was just a... An incredible experience, and I, I've been friends with Harrison ever since, and Michelle whenever I see her. Did you have Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer in mind as you were writing the scripts, or uh, did you ever? Was there a casting process, or was it just always Harrison and and, and Michelle? Or uh, you know? No, I mean, no, I didn't. I didn't ever, you know, didn't conceive. I didn't conceive <laughs> of the idea that it was going to get made. <laughs> I was, I just was. It was a fantasy of a psychological thriller that I wanted to see. I thought it might be an interesting idea. Um, so I was kind of taken by surprise by all of it. I never, I didn't dream that big. But fortunately, uh, Robert Zemeckis is Robert Zemeckis, and he can dream that big. And he, he lined them up, and then there was casting of the other roles. The, and uh, I just watched and learned. And it's a beautiful movie. If you guys haven't seen What Lies Beneath, it's an absolute classic of the 1990s. Um, I mean, your acting career spans over like three decades. Roles in daytime soaps, Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, uh, The Usual Suspects. A lot of people forget that you're in The uh, Usual Suspects, Clear and Present Danger. Uh, besides MCU roles, what uh, what role do fans come up on you on the street and say, hey, I loved you in Indiana Jones? Are there any, uh, 
Any recognizing? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, well, those are you're talking about things where I, you know, I got, you know, hey, do you want to do two days of this? And I'd say, yeah. And especially, I love the script of Usual Suspects, and I really liked they were um, Chris McQuarrie and Brian Singer were these young guys with this amazing project, and uh, they were also kind of new in town. And uh, we talked about a couple of roles. I ended up. <laughs> Really cool people got the really good roles, and I ended up, uh, you know, the surgeon guy who got to talk to the burned up guy, and that was cool. And I'm <laughs> proud to be part of that. So those were all kind of just, hey, I got a day on something, and and I was happy to do it in L.A. And um, but then the gigs that people come up to me, and I'm always surprised. I would say, uh, I did I did two episodes of Sports Night, Aaron Sorkin's show, yeah. at the end of that show where I played this mysterious billionaire who buys the network, and I. Maybe I'm imagining this, but uh, I have a relationship with Aaron Sorkin that goes back a long time. And I, I feel like he was saying that if the show went one more season, this guy, Calvin Traeger, was going to be around. There's an astonishing number of Calvin Traeger recognizers out there. I did one episode, like most actors in New York, of Sex in the City. and You were in Sex in the City. That's people, right. <laughs> I was. I was a, I was a pathological. I was a, I was a liar on a speed date who claimed to be a doctor. And, but Miranda was lying too. I, whatever, I'm not going to get into it. Um, um, those are the main things that people come up. And uh, New Adventures of Old Christina sitcom I did with uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus a lot. It has its fans. Well, I mean, people remember you from all over uh, your your vast three decades of, of work. I want to talk, obviously, a little bit about the MCU. Um, I mean, in 2008, uh, your first appearance in the MCU, Agent Phil Coulson in the first Iron Man movie. Uh, something fans, I don't think, give Coulson quite enough credit for is that even before that famous Nick Fury uh, post credit sequ sequence when he uh, announces the in Avengers initiative, um, you were actually the first person to tease that larger Avengers world when you uttered the word strategic homeland intervention enforcement. Homeland intervention enforcement. You still division. know it. See, I, you, I've never written down. You know it. You know it. 90% I mean, of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents can't say that. When you first read that script in Iron Man, I mean, did you uh, did did that line have any impact? And do you have any idea the doors it would open up, uh, not only just in the Avengers world, but in the entire film industry? Um, no, because that wasn't in there. It was very, it was very much. I loved I loved a few comics when I was a kid: Warlock, Iron Man, Iron Fist, especially. And so when I heard they were doing that and I saw the cast they put together, I was so excited to go see it. And then uh, I got a call that John Favreau, my neighbor from a couple blocks away, um, that there was a, a role of an agent. And I don't think he had a name. He didn't even have a first name agent. Um, maybe he did. Um, but he, uh, and it didn't, I don't know, there was a couple, maybe two scenes, not much, a couple of lines, but I didn't give, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, and I signed up for it. I was thrilled. I was sure I was going to be cut out with that amazing cast of actors. But then they, as it went along, they seemed to have a need for this guy, and uh, they liked the kind of snarky repartee. Um, <laughs> they liked watching Tony Stark basically uh, verbally beat him up. And um, and then uh, as it went along, they kind of gave him more and more stuff to do, including including one day this piece of dialogue that said strategic homeland, etc. And I went. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that my shield? Because up till then he was just kind of like this knucklehead bureaucrat from a from a mysterious agency. And then they made it this whole other thing where oh that's actually that's his cover. He actually is a lot more knowledgeable and potent than he might seem. And uh I mean to, to this day I think about that experience and I almost die of geekiness. Um, and then at the end of it, um, Pepper Potts is saying, thank you, Agent Colson. I was like, I got a name. Yeah. I got a name. <laughs> um, well, fanboys in the audience uh, in the theaters just went nuts when you said strategic homeland intervention enforcement and logistics division. We all lost their minds because we yeah. knew what that meant. Uh, the the uh, Colson snowball kept rolling down the hill in Iron Man 2 when uh, you were sitting down with um, uh, Tony Stark. You were in Tony Stark's lab and you said, Nick Fury wants to send me out to New Mexico. Nobody knew what that meant at the time that it meant, oh, God, he's going to go to New Including Mexico. Me. Really? You didn't know you were going to go get Thor's hammer? You didn't realize that that tied no, into the next Thor movie no, at all? Um, oh, no, 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 no. That, that scene, a lot of those scenes, there's, there's, you know, the Robert magic, sometimes you're not sure what you're going to hear. There's a lot of beautiful improv. I think that's one of the great things that made 
he is like Tony Stark. He's not going to stick too closely to the rules, but which makes it a thrilling experience to act with. But definitely, I wasn't quite sure what was coming at me. And then at a certain point, uh, I think Lou D'Esposito, the great Marvel exec, stepped in and said, um, oh, no, he said, okay, so they're going to so tell him you got to go. Tell him you got to go this time. I was like, I don't, don't want to go. Where do I got to go? He said, this was in Iron Man 2, right? So he said, you, you tell him you got to go to New Mexico. And I said, oh, okay. Okay. And they're like, okay, we're rolling. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry, I got to go. I got to go to New Mexico. And, and he says, Lands of Enchantment. And I was like, yeah, okay, good. That was good. Um, damn it. He came up with a really good one. I was like, and, and I didn't have a good one back. And finally, afterwards, I went over to Lou and I said, what's, um, I should know this, just my character would know this. What's in New Mexico? He goes, oh, Thor. Thor's in New Mexico. You can go find Thor's hammer. Did nobody tell you this? After you like, shot the scene? <laughs> <laughs> After we know in the middle of the scene. Wow. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of questions in the comment section. Um, I want to see if we can field some Q&A from the audience. Uh, Lords of the Lawn Box uh, asks, how emotional was filming the last season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? And I do want to talk a little bit about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but uh, how emotional was that last season? It was very emotional. Now, we had a, to be honest, we had a very strange situation with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which was, A, life imitated art from the get-go, and that we had a bunch, a guy who didn't know, a guy who was dead, Clark <laughs> coming back and with a new team who some of whom were experienced and some of whom weren't. And we became a family and it became a show about family. And we got very close, a lot of us. And, um, and so we went on this ride, but we also never knew when our family was going to be broken up. And at every season we wouldn't know uh, until, you know, we'd get find out. Oh, Oh, yep. They're bringing us back again. Oh, they're bringing us back again. And finally, at the we were pretty clear that the end of season five was going to be it. And the end of season five was Phil Coulson is, is not going to make it. He's going to Tahiti to end his days. He's dying. And uh, and they were, the showrunners were pretty clear, like, no, yeah, this is the real thing. I was like, oh, OK. God, this breaks my heart. This guy breaks my heart every couple of years. He breaks my heart. And um. <laughs> And so we had the final episode was called The End, and we had this very cheerful goodbye, both on the show and in real life. And, and then it was over, and then we got a call saying, we actually want to do two more 13-episode seasons. And so I was this other guy who was quite evil until he wasn't, and then this new season coming up. So we had two more seasons over this shot in space about a year. And uh, we were almost goodbyed out by then, but now, I don't know, I, I have to admit, I was at a car parade social distancing birthday party for Chloe Bennett with Elizabeth Henstridge and Jeff Ward and some people the other day. So we're all still very close. Well, Tina uh, Marie asked in the comment section, Clark, can you describe season seven's uh, Philinda in three words? Um, Tough boy, that's a tricky Tina. one. Um, <laughs> lots of baggage. There it is. <laughs> Man, we got so many people uh, in the audience. I want to ask one qu last question for myself. Uh, in season six, you played Sarge, a uh, much darker version of Agent Coulson. What was it like bringing that uh, darker side of the character, actually getting to fight some, some people that, you know, your co-star is getting... What was, what was that experience like, kind of flipping the script on the personality of Coulson? Boy, it was really fun. It was really fun to be the this kind of mysterious bad guy who's murderous and has no... It has nothing to give that might be bad. I don't know what to say. I have my, my language hasn't gotten better in quarantine. Um, it was really freeing. You know, Coulson is always walking a very careful moral line while having to do very practical, ruthless things. This guy's just about the ruthless because he had a bigger purpose in mind that was kind of surprising. A lot of secrets. And it, it was interesting to be at odds with. It was a very different Felinda. She was shooting me a lot. Um, to be at odds with all the people that I had worked so closely with. Okay, we got another question there in the comment section. Josh, Joshua uh, Palace says, huge fan, Mr. Greg. Uh, your adaptation of Choke was a total masterpiece. Uh, would you be interested in adapting other novels to film? Thank you, Joshua. Clearly a genius. Um, I loved directing Choke. I loved how it turned out. Chuck Palahniuk who, Palahniuk, who you have on here, is one of the greatest people and one of the most interesting writers I've ever come across. Um, I had an amazing experience doing that. Yeah, I'd love to do, adapt something. I'm working on some original stuff right now. Um, 
and adapting a true story from the news. But uh, book adaption, adaptations are really tricky, but really, really rewarding if you can get them right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget getting a hold of the rights to that kind of sought after book just by luck and being very frozen for a moment by how much great writing was in it, how much great dialogue. And my first conversation with the generous and amazing Chuck Palahniuk was, he said, look, just don't be too faithful to the book. And I was like, wow. Okay. Wow. That that's guy's, rare. That's interesting. And it totally <laughs> freaked me up. Yeah. Yeah. Just do whatever you want to do. Uh, so on the game, it's an obvious question. Are we ever going to see Agent Coulson on the big screen? Before I get to that question, I'll let you think about that question for just a second. Um, Captain Marvel, nobody really thought we'd see uh, Agent Coulson back on the big screen until Captain Marvel came out and you played a much younger Phil Coulson. Was was there any de-aging technology or was that all just makeup and your own handsome face? Was there any anything digital going on there? That's really that's a sweet and hilarious <laughs> question, Chuck. Um, yeah, no, I just went to a spa for the weekend. <laughs> uh, no, um, there was a lot. I think most of the budget was spent trying to make me look 20 years younger. Um, yeah, we had dots. <laughs> we had dots on our face. It can be told. Um, mine were black. Sam's were white, which was kind of funny. It was like that episode of Star Trek, the original, um, where one guy's half black and one guy's half. Anyway, um, and we would do the scenes. And then later they would just do their magic to us. That technology has come a long way. And uh, oh, some crazy wigs. Um, <laughs> me especially and uh and then bingo all of a sudden we were walking out of a blockbuster in the 90s yeah and then all, you've got wonderful new instagram uh profile pictures from that too i mean just you know you just de-age yourself on social exactly. media like 50 years um, i look amazing people <laughs> you look great uh so any oh, let's go back to my original question any chance that we might see agent colson on the big screen ever again maybe captain marvel 2 um, you know, so far in the MCU, you know, there was the Marvel Television MCU. They were not super crossing over. At first, that was the big pitch on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but they definitely kind of went separate directions for a minute. Um, the only return of Coulson has not has been pre-Avengers. So they haven't dealt with Coulson being alive in the MCU. As of yet, um, they've certainly got a lot of uh, fascinating characters that they're exploring now. I never say never because, uh, you know, it's the world of the comics and they have alternate realities and timelines. And, you know, I'll always be happy if I get a call from them. But I also feel very grateful for the ride that I've had there. Absolutely. Well, guys, we have a few more minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. Um, something I wanted to ask you, you brought up uh, season one of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. How much has that show evolved? Like, how different is it now than when you first started? I mean, what was the original plan for the show and then can you point to a specific season, a specific episode where they said, okay, we're going to, for lack of a better term, flip the script and go in a completely other direction. Like how, how much has that show changed? That's a, that's a really good question. I mean, it was a pilot uh, written by Joss, directed by Joss. And then Joss went off and did Age of Ultron. And, uh, you know, his very talented brother and uh, brother's wife, uh, Marissa, their great writing team on their own, uh, they took it over with Jeff Bell and got an amazing team of writers. And they they took on the really formidable task of how do you bring Marvel, essentially, S.H.I.E.L.D. to ABC weekly one hour with commercial breaks and kind of standalone episodes. And it was uh, definitely, you know, it's been talked about a lot. There was definitely some moments where they were trying to find their footing all of us how to make that work you know and they're standing up against these incredible movies and at the same time um at the same time if you look back at season one they also had this secret they had to hold out which is they couldn't mention hydra until winter soldier and they had this big crossover like two-thirds of the way through the season and some of the stuff with bill paxton and the way it shifts at the end i'm very very proud of and i'm really proud of the show it, it became Certainly, as the show went along, ABC was really let us become more the dark noir show we wanted to be. I think it was season four when they did three separate pods, they called them, um, and really let it be more like runs of the comics. And from there, I, I really stand in awe of the way the writers of the show, every season would just tear it down to the studs and start over with a different thing. Oh, now Colson Sarge. Now we're in the future. This coming up season, we are doing some time traveling. And uh, there you go. 
with some very interesting missions that might even involve uh, Say it. helping people who might one day become Hydra. Uh, excellent. Any tie-ins to uh, any of the Loki stuff? Uh, anything you can say? <laughs> Probably not. I don't want to pry. No. The only thing that's been revealed that I'm allowed to talk about is we might run into some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents from different time periods. Cool. We got we one more question. Some people. Yeah, sorry. That's it. No, no, no. Um, I, wow. I totally interrupted you at the wrong, wrong time. No, no. <laughs> we got a. Uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I'm, I'm just, gonna, <laughs> people in chat are hating me right now. What I was going to say. I would have just gotten myself killed. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, last one comes from Downright Nerdy Podcast. Uh, thank you for the Super Chat donations. all going to charity. He said, thank you, Mr. Greg, for taking the time for doing this. We are huge fans and couldn't be prouder to be fans of yours now. Thank you for spending some time with us for the great cause. Hope you and your family are staying safe. That comes from Downright Nerdy Podcast. That's very, very kind, Downright Nerdy Podcast. My family and I are staying very safe. We're, we're playing by the rules. Um, it's a very strange time. I mean, come on. Anyone who goes to a comic book store or watches the stuff I watch, you can't help but see the weird dystopian thing we're living through. And I don't know. I kind of I think it's a good time for a new season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because it's all about how we come together and recognize our connectedness is going to be how we get through this. Not a bad so, time yes. for some time travel either. <laughs> Not bad, no. Well, Clark, thanks so much for taking your time for doing this. We really, really appreciate it. Donating your time for charity. Couldn't thank you enough. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, guys, we've got a lot more mainframe Comic-Con. Two whole days worth, as a matter of fact, live from Chicago Comics in the heart of the Windy City. Stick around. We got, uh, after this commercial break, we've got the, the cast of AMC's Nosferatu, Joe Hill, Jakar Smith, showrunner, Jamie O'Brien. Lots of great stuff, guys. So stick around. We'll be back in about five minutes. <laughs> 